All right, so my name's Sophia. For those who don't know me, I'm going to be doing transfusion reactions. So when I picked this subject, I didn't realize how extensive it was, so I'm just going to skip over a few slides probably for sake of time. Um, so basically, we're going to talk about reasons to transfuse patients, the types of transfusion reactions. I'm just going to talk about the acute transfusion reactions, not the delayed ones. We're going to talk about management and when to admit these patients and when to send them home. Okay, so what kind of, when we say blood transfusion, what are we talking about? What kind of blood transfusions do we do? Right, pack good blood cells, you do it for anemia, for trauma, blood loss, what else? FFPs, right? Platelets, good. Um, what else? Cryo, prothrombin complex concentrates, anyone know what that is? K-Centra, right? Um, IVIG, albumin, barely give it, but basically when, a, when you consent your patients, you, for any, for any type of uh, blood transfusion, you have to talk about all the risks. Um, and even transfusing something like albumin, albumin counts as a blood transfusion, so all of them need consent. So transfusion reactions get divided into two, um, immediate reactions and delayed reactions. We're just going to talk about the immediate ones, and the immediate ones get divided into immunological ones and um, non-immunological ones. The immunological ones ac include acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, urticaria, anaphylaxis, Trally, and then the non-immunological non include taco, transfusion-related sepsis, and a very rare one, just air embolism, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, and hypothermia. Okay, these are the delayed ones, um, but like I said, for the sake of time, we're not really going to go over them. Um, so basically, we're going to go over each one of the acute ones, but the most important thing is your immediate actions when you suspect um, that there's a transfusion reaction. You want to immediately stop the transfusion until you figure out what's going on. And then after that, it's just your, your normal ABCs. You have to look at your airway because a lot of the time these patients need to be intubated or be put on BiPAP or supplemental oxygen. You want to check vitals to see if they're febrile, if they're hypotense. You want to do your normal physical exam. A lot of the times you're going to start giving um, fluids and you want to give NS because dextrose increases hemolysis and ringers can initiate clotting. Um, you want to confirm that the correct product was transfused to the correct patient, because that does happen. And then you want to call blood banks sometimes, especially if you think that the wrong product was given to the wrong patient. These are the risks of these reactions occurring. Um, usually when we consent patients, they're usually just concerned about getting HIV or hepatitis, but we need to talk to them about all the other possible um, reactions that they can get. So we'll start. The first one is uh, urticarial transfusion reaction. Basically with this, you just get hives or itching, but that's the only symptom that you have. It's not a really a contraindication to stopping blood transfusion. Usually what we do is we stop them for 15, 30 minutes, give um, Benadryl, and wait for the itching or rash to go away, and then you can actually just restart the blood transfusion. Usually, sometimes it'll start it at a lower rate. Um, and then your febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction here, you just have a fever, nothing else. No other systemic symptoms, no wheezing, nothing like that. Um, the only problem with this is that this is a diagnosis of exclusion, because a lot of times when you develop fever while getting a blood transfusion, you have to rule out all the other bad transfusion reactions first. Um, and again, the treatment is just you give them some Tylenol. But, yeah, correct. So a lot of times some attendings what they want to do, and I'll, I got evidence that some 50% want to, 50% don't. You can pre-medicate your patients. Since these two reactions that we just talked about are pretty benign, you can give them Tylenol or you can give them Benadryl before the transfusion. Some people don't like doing it because they don't like having an, like hiding a septic or an anaphylactic shock, but up to you. So then primary hypotensive transfusion reactant, this is a rare one. Basically your blood pressure drops 30, um, 30 points after starting the blood transfusion. You stop the blood transfusion and your blood pressure goes straight back up. 
Um, again, this is a diagnosis of exclusion and um, usually it happens mostly when you transfuse platelets. Up to here, all these patients can go home. They don't need to be admitted to the hospital. But after this one, all the ones we're going to talk about, most patients need to be admitted and you, a lot of times just to the MICU. So acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. Basically this is when you give the wrong blood to the wrong patient. It's a clinical error, it's ABO incompatibility, and it causes intravascular hemolysis of the transfused red blood cells. You get symptoms of fever, chills, flank pain. If you go into DIC, you can have oozing from your IV site. Um, your blood pressure drops, you can go into shock. Um, and you can get an acute kidney injury slash complete renal failure. You want to call blood bank for this one because you really want to make sure that the wrong blood, if the wrong blood was given to the wrong patient and you want to immediately stop the blood transfusion and start um, simultaneous IV hydration and diuresis. So basically when you, what you want to do is you want to replace the IV tubing. You don't want to continue to give the blood. You want to stop the blood and then you want to start giving them IV fluids through a different tubing. You want to give them a lot of fluid to maintain a urinary output. You want to give them Lasix or Manitol. Like I said, complications include acute kidney injury, DIC. Um, they can actually also become anemic and you might actually need to give them packed red blood cells. This time hopefully ones that do match their blood. And yeah, and the mortality does change depending on how much blood was actually transfused. So labs that you send, you want to cross match their blood from before the transfusion and their blood after the transfusion. You want to do a Coombs test, you want to check their renal function, you want to check labs for hemolysis, you want to check labs for DIC, you want to check their urine. And um, you also want to keep the blood, if you stop the transfusion, you want to keep the blood that you're transfusing and if there's any left, you want to send that one for a Coombs test also and you want to cross match that blood. So don't throw out the blood even if it's finished. Uh, this is just the table of who's compatible to donate to who. All right, so now we're going to move on to TACO and we're going to talk about transfusion associated circulatory overload and then trolley. Um, basically, this is just pulmonary edema due to vascular, um, just because you're transfusing blood. So you go into kind of this pulmonary edema from excess volume. Usually this happens when you give a large amount of blood in a short amount of time or patients who have cardiovascular or renal disease. Um, treatment, you want to give them oxygen. A lot of times you need to start them on BiPAP or intubate them and you just want to derease them as well. What are the symptoms? You go in, you have acute respiratory distress, hypertension, you start coughing, you get tachycardia, you can get JVD, basically the same symptoms as if you were in um, fluid overload. Um, so basically this is, patients who are at risk are young and older patients. This happens with kids. Um, patients who have CHF, patients who have end-stage renal. Um, Mortality is one to eight percent. Does anybody know how much volume there is in an actual unit of packed red blood cells? Huh? 300, so close. So have you guys ever heard someone say giving a unit of packed red blood cells is like giving a, a liter of fluid? So if it's 300, how is that so? Basically when you give a liter of IV fluids, two thirds of the fluid goes into your extravascular space and a third goes to the intravascular space. Um, so when you give a unit of packed red blood cells, it's all going into the intravascular space. So it's kind of equivalent to giving a liter. Also for just for when you're transfusing peds, um, just remember that the dose, the, not the dose, but the amount to, of packed red blood cells to give is 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram. Okay. So now we're going to talk about trally, which is transfusion related lung injury. Um, this is basically, in short, it's neutrophil activation, activating like an inflammatory cascade that causes lung injury. It's basically kind of like ARDS, but caused by a blood transfusion. You, got, you have to have hypoxemia and you have to have um, pulmonary edema on your chest x-ray. And usually the way you can see it is because you, patients go into respiratory distress, but it's out of proportion with the amount of volume that they've received. And treatment is the same. You want to give oxygen, BiPAP, 
intubate, they become hypotense, so you might not need to start levo. Steroids is up for debate because it is, is, since it's kind of like ARDS, but in trial it's shown that it doesn't change increase or decrease the mortality. So if a patient's really that sick, you might as well give it, but it hasn't sh shown any improvement. So basically the way um, trolley works, it's, there's the theory that it's a two-hit mechanism. So basically you kind of have an underlying lung illness. <coughs> Sorry. And basically the endothelial cells in your intravascular um, lung, like in the microvasculature, sequester neutrophils and then those neutrophils become easily activated by any little tiny signal. So then the second step is when you transfuse the blood, um, a tiny factor in the blood activates all those neutrophils, it releases cytokines, it releases oxidase, all those things, damages the capillary endothelium, causes capillary leak syndrome and then pulmonary edema. So you get the same symptoms, shortness of breath, hypoxia, you can get fever, you can become hypotense. You can have an increase in white blood cells, it's not always seen, um, and yeah. So patients who are at risk is like patients who are already critically ill, liver patients, patients who drink, patients who smoke, but it affects all age groups, it affects both sex the same way. Um, and this one occurs pretty quickly as well kind of a table to show the difference between the two, but basically just remember that um, trolley, you might have fever, mostly it's just hypotension. It's like an ARDS versus taco being fluid overload, okay? But for both of these, you have to rule out an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, you have to rule out anaphylaxis, and you have to rule out sepsis as well. So the other thing you can do in the, that I saw, and it wasn't up to date, so I'm going to include it, but you can do, if you really want to get fancy, you can do a fluid analysis of the actual, like, edema, like the pulmonary f um, fluid. So if I'm saying TACO, is that a cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? It'll be cardiogenic, right? And does cardiogenic have a transudate or exudate? It's a transudate, right? So how are your proteins in that one? protein ratio would be low, right? And if it's trolley, is it cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic? It's non-cardiogenic, so it's an exudate, and your protein ratios would be high. But I don't think anybody, I've never seen anybody do this, so. <laughs> um, so, so it's, I'm almost finished, I think. The next one is septic transfusion reaction, and this is basically when um, the blood products come with a bacteria, it can come with a parasite, it can come with a virus, it can come with a fungus, it can come with a prion. That's why patient people who lived in um, Europe for more than three months from like 1980 to 1999 can't donate blood because of mad cow disease. So, but obviously the most common is not that, it's gram positive staph and strep. Um, you get the same symptoms of septic shock. You treat with broad spectrum antibiotics and you gram stain and culture the blood that was being transfused, along with obviously culturing the patient. Then you can have anaphylactic transfusion reaction, where basically you have an allergy to a product within the blood. You get the same symptoms of anaphylactic angioedema, wheezing, hypotension. I'm going to stop the blood, give epi, um, give antihistamines. There was one, this is, this is from step one, I just remembered it, because basically the patients who, de who develop like terrible and fatal anaphylaxis are patients who have select immunoglobulin deficiency. It's like the patients who didn't make IgA and then they get transfused blood, have IgA, and go into really terrible, severe anaphylactic shock. And then your other types of transfusion reactions, which I'll just go over in two seconds. Air embolism, which is super rare. You can get hyperkalemia, and this is actually important for us because when we massively transfuse patients, patients can actually become very hyperkalemic because one unit of packed red blood, like red blood cells contains more than 60 milliequivalents of, sodium, of potassium, and when blood is stored for more than 12 days, it can actually cause leakage, and you can have more. It can also cause ca hypocalcemia, because um, blood products have citrate as the anticoagulant, and citrate can bind calcium and it can cause tetany. And you can get hypothermia. And this is just a table from up to date that helps you guide 
which way to go. Um, the lab studies that we kind of already went over and treatment. All right, I think that's my time. Any questions?